Hello and welcome to the webinar on IPM and crucifer crops, focus on the yellow margin leaf beetle. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. A PDF handout of the slides for this webinar is also available. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a very quick rundown on how today's webinar will work. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and then after that, we'll have an additional 30 minutes for your questions. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. We're very glad today to have a team of researchers from a NIFA OREI project dedicated, dedicated to organic pest management for crucifer vegetable production in the South. Um, we have Ramohan Rao Balusu and Ayanaba Majumdar of Auburn University and Ronald Cave of the University of Florida. Dr. Ramohan Balusu will be speaking um, he'll be speaking after the introduction um, given by Ayanava Majumdar. Um, Ramohan Balusu is a research fellow at Auburn University, and he works on ecologically based pest management tactics in fruit and vegetable crops. He has been working on yellow margin leaf beetle, um, yellow margin leaf beetle in organic crucifer production since 2006. Then um, we'll have Don Dr. Ronald Cave, who's a professor of entomology and nematology at the University of Florida Indian River Research and Education Center. His research um, at the Hayslip Biological Control Research and Containment Laboratory um, focuses on biological control of invasive arthropods, particularly the importation of exotic insects as candidate biological control agents, assessment of commercial natural enemies, and a study of the biology of parasitoids and predators. Dr. Ayanaba Majumdar is an extension entomologist with the Alabama Cooperative Extension System, and his work focuses on developing vegetable IPM recommendations for a variety of crops. He is also the SARE program coordinator at Auburn University, and he has established a strong organic educational program for small producers in Alabama. So Ayanaba is going to introduce the presentation. So I'm going to um, hand over the screen control to him. Ayanava, you should be able to click on the screen and take control now. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, again, my name is Ayanava. A lot of the producers um, around here in the Southeast uh, just call me Dr. A. Um, so you may find me with many funny names online, but welcome to the presentation. And I'm glad to be part of this. Um, just give you a little layout of how we're going to what topics we're going to deal with. Um, after this introduction, we'll talk about some of the research findings uh, related to yellow margin leaf beetle from Alabama, and then shift to, uh, uh, to Florida uh, for research updates. And then at the uh, end, we'll talk about the combined IPM recommendations, uh, lessons we have learned, some of the challenges, and we'll end with uh, talking about some extension IPM resources. Uh, why are we talking about this? Insect. Well, um, first off, we do know that uh, organic uh, crop production in general in Southeast uh, uh, or Southern US is a challenge. Uh, and one of the biggest limiting factor or the yield limiting factor are insect pests. Uh, the problem is insect pests attack at the critical point uh, in the pro crop production cycle. And if you think of crucifers, uh, where, where the leaf is the edible part, that's where the insect is attacking or contaminating. So that's why this insect, uh, yellow margin leaf beetle, is a highly relevant pest for us uh, in the southeast and other, uh, other places uh, across US. And in general, we do lack uh, effective IPM recommendations so far. And today, you will hear some uh, advances that we have made uh, in the research. So uh, now that we know we had some challenges, uh, we went ahead and put uh, OEI pro project together um, uh, two years back, and uh, we have been working very hard on that. Um, and we follow several um, research or uh, IPM tactic areas that are recommended by the National Organic Program. Uh, those we also called as levels. And you can see those three levels on your screen, systems-based practices, mechanical practices, and then bioinsecticides. Uh, those are the three national nationally, NOP 
uh, recommended practices, and we're going to focus on um, level one and level uh, three today. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the ongoing uh, producer training programs and the resources. With this, I'm going to finish my introduction and hand this over to Dr. Ammohan Balasu. Um, thank you, Dr. Ayanawa. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk about this uh, yellow margin lispital. Uh, first, I'm going to give a brief uh, in background about the pest for those of you who are for those of you who are not aware of this insect. Um, yellow margin leaf beetle, I will be calling this as YMLB or just a leaf beetle. Uh, scientific name is Macrothica ocralima. Is a most problematic pest um, mainly in organic uh, crucifer vegetable production in southern United States. It is native to South America in and it, this beetle was reported first time in US in 1947 in Mobile, Alabama. And, and is currently widely distributed throughout the southern states from Texas all the way to North Carolina. This beetle is a crucifer specific uh, fish. That means it attacked the plant species in the family uh, Brassicaceae. That includes cabbage, mustard, uh, turnips, um, colored grains, and so on. Here you can see the adult beetles. This is the biology of this insect. The adult beetle has a yellow margin on their wings. That's why they are commonly called um, yellow margin leaf beetle. Um, the female deposit their eggs on the plant surface, um, mainly on the undersurface, uh, underside of the leaf in, in small clusters. Larvae hatch from these eggs, and they feed on the leaves and cause severe defoliation. The larvae usually pass through four larval instars. The pupae commonly found on the dried leaves attached to the plants or also on the plant debris. This entire life cycle of this pest will take approximately 30 days um, and it has a multiple generations uh, in one year. That means as long as the conditions are favorable, the insect will be keep damaging the crop and um, you know, reproducing the offsprings. So here I have a couple of pictures to show the damage that it caused. On the top left side, um, this is the turnip leaf destroyed by the leaf beetle larvae. At the bottom right, the adult beetle uh, damaged on the Napa cabbage plant. So now I'm going to talk briefly about the behavior and ecology of this insect because this is very important for us to understand uh, the ecology of the insect to, uh, to develop some of the management tactics. The many growers in Alabama and other parts of uh, the southern states, they grow crucifer vegetables in both spring and the, in the fall and spring season. The adult beetle, they migrate from the, war, uh, from the east waiting sites uh, when temperature uh, cool down uh, approximately 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they move to the fall season brassica crops, then cause the, then start attacking the, the crop. Um, I, I'm sorry, I have a difficulty with these animations. They are not moving fast. Um, then they cause a severe defoliation on the fall season crop. Then weather gets uh, very cold, like uh, uh, below the freezing temperatures, the beetles usually overwinter. Um, starting from the middle of December up to the March in the dried uh, leaf or in the soil. Then again, when temperatures warm up, the adults emerge from these overwintering sites and attack the spring season brassica crops. So now you can see the damage they cause in the spring season. Again, they, they actually defoliate the crop. During the hot uh, summer months, the beetles uh, used to wait on the uh, wild uh, crucifer, uh, wild, wild mustard, and then, I'm sorry, I have a difficulty with the, the wild mustard, and they move back to the, move back to the, then they come back to the uh, crucifer crops in the next season, following season. So this whole thing uh, t uh, start over again. So here, uh, this picture was taken in the, one of the local organic farm in Alabama. 
Um, this is an Apacabes uh, crop. It's uh, completely damaged with the yellow marginal leaf beetle. I want to, uh, uh, you know, um, state here that this is not, this is a typical damage that we usually see in this, um, uh, most of the uh, growers, organic growers from, um, this is not an extreme condition. Even after the uh, complete defoliation of the leaves, the beetle continue to eat on the exposed tubers and also of the turnip and uh, radishes and cause uh, complete crop loss. So the, um, till now, the, um, uh, there are no uh, effective control options that are available to the organic growers um, prior to our research on this beetle. Um, the most of the growers uh, in the Alabama and other, other states, um, because of the difficulty to control these pests, they, they, they quit growing some of the high value uh, brassica vegetables that are susceptible to the beetle's damage. Even though this beetle attacks um, most of the brassica plants, uh, they, they do show the strong preference to certain host plants, such as turnips. Uh, that made us to think whether we can use, could we use the turnip as a trap crop um, to control this insect. So that's uh, get into, to test that idea, we, we conduct an experiment with a trap crop. All right, so to test that idea, we, we tested the trap crop as one of the management tactics, uh, which is a system-based practice. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to give the very details of this uh, uh, technique because we already know the many speakers they already presented um, about the trap cropping. So, but briefly, a perimeter trap cropping is planting of most attractive crop on the field borders to to attract to lure the pest away from the cash crop, which is our target crop. For instance, here we can see in the conventional planting. Uh, where there is no in, uh, trap crop, the insects are distributed all over the uh, all over the uh, plot, all over the plant, all over the crop. However, by having a trap crop at the border of the cash crop, we can intercept and concentrate the pest population on the border. So that now, if it is necessary, we can spray, um, we can kill these insects on the trap crop by using insecticides or other control tactics so that we don't, we don't have to spray the insecticide all over the field. Just by, by treating the trap crop, um, it can reduce the pest population and uh, protect the uh, main crop. The yellow margin leaf is a good candidate uh, for controlling uh, by using the trap crop because it shows us, it, like I said, it shows the strong uh, preference among the host plants for feeding and also oviposition. And second thing is they migrate into the field rather than emerging from the field. Therefore, when they are migrating, we can intercept uh, their movement. The third uh, characteristic that it shows is it exhibits a strong edge effect. It usually um, aggregate and uh, colonize the field borders. And also, uh, finally, it has a limited mobility. Uh, on the crop. So once, uh, therefore, it is less likely to move from trap crop to the cash crop. So that makes um, a good um, a potential uh, for the trap crop to work well in this system. So now we are coming to the methods of uh, our experiment. We use, like, like I said, we use the turnip as a trap crop and cabbage or mustard or napa cabbage as a cash crops. So we have chosen this uh, plant species as cash crop because um, the grower, th this is based on the grower's uh, choice. Uh, whatever the growers want to grow in their farm, uh, we have chosen their crop as a cash crop and use the turnip as a trap crop. And we, we, uh, we sampled for the leaf beetle um, larvae and adults at the weekly intervals. And at the end of the uh, growing season, we determine the damage based on the scale of one to six. Um, the one is very light defoliation, whereas six is a complete defoliation. So this is the field layout of our uh, trap crop plots. We planted the trap crop in the perimeter uh, two weeks in, ad in advance 
to the, the main crop that is the cabbage and each and the, and each of these replicates they were separated with uh, approximately 20 feet apart and each row is about 40 feet long um, 2.5 feet wide um, with 3.5 feet apart from each row all right here you can see the effect of the trap crop um, on your left uh, you can see the cabbage crop which is little or no damage uh, by having the trap crop as uh, at the perimeter whereas on the right you can see the cabbage which is severely defoliated with the leaf beetle um, so it clearly shows that the cabbage uh, the trap crop is uh, very effective in controlling uh, the leaf beetle. This is the graphical uh, presentation of my data. Uh, the x-axis shows you the mean number of adults per plant. Here the y-axis is the sampling dates. The blue color represents the trap crop, uh, insect number on the trap crop, whereas the green is a cash crop bordered by the trap crop. and uh, the red color is a control where the cash crop with no uh, trap crop border. So the result shows that when the cabbage bordered with the turnip uh, significantly reduced the uh, number of uh, beetles on them compared to the control. And also, if you look at it uh, on the trap crop, after the, uh, this arrow represents the date of application of the insecticide on the trap crop. So after one application of insecticide has knocked down the insect population and uh, they never record back. So this clearly shows that by using a perimeter trap crop with the turnip extracted the beetles away from cabbage cash crop. So in, in terms of damage, the lower number of uh, leaf beetles on the, on, the, on, the, on the trap crop treatment resulted in low or no damage compared to the control. So in summary, turnip is highly attractive trap crop for yellow margin uh, leaf beetle in organic cabbage production. The perimeter planting of turnip in the border of the cabbage limited the yellow margin leaf beetle infestation on the border. More importantly, single application of insecticide on the trap crop effectively reduced the beetle damage on the cabbage cash crop. So other part of our study is uh, testing some of these uh, bio-rational insecticides um, against uh, this yellow margin leaf beetle. We tested the bio and the botanical insecticides um, to see, you know, to, uh, as a last resort a therapeutic tool to control uh, this leaf beetle. So we, we evaluated the following uh, materials. The first one is pyganic, which is a botanical insecticide. Um, the interest, uh, which is a, a spinosad, the actual ingredient is spinosad. Um, the no fly, which is um, um, fungal entomopathogenic pathogenic fungal formulation. The grandiva is uh, again a bacterial formulation. Um, then we rotated the interest with a no fly, um, also with the pyganic. All these materials we applied at the field recommended rate. Here is the field layout. The treatment plots uh, consist of 35 feet long, a single row of uh, turnips, and uh, each, each treatment plot is uh, separated by 35 feet. And treatments are arranged in a randomized block design, replicated for four times. The insect a beetle population was a beetle, uh, 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 beetle was sampled at um, every three-day interval. Um, and uh, treatments were applied at weekly intervals. We collected the uh, data on the number of larvae per plant and the adults, and also the damage at the harvest. Again, the damage was based on the scaling of one to six. One is a light defoliation, whereas six is a complete defoliation. So here are the results. Again, here the y-axis is shows the mean number of uh, larvae per plant, and um, x-axis represents the sampling dates and the arrows indicates the um, date of application of the insecticides. Here the red line represents the control 
blue indicates uh, plots treated with uh, no fly, uh, which is a fungal formulation. Um, green represents the plots treated with the grandiva um, bacterial formulation. Then other treatments like a pyganic entrust and um, entrust alternated with no fly or uh, pyganic, they are in black. So clearly, the plots treated with pyganic entrust or entrust alternated with um, either no fly or pyganic were very effective in reducing the insect numbers. Um, throughout the season. They are significantly lower than other treatments. So followed by the Grandiva, which is a bacterial formulation, and then no fly is less effective. However, um, it is significantly different from the control. All right, so this is the damage, um, and these are the treatment plots. Again, the low number of um, insects on the plot treated with the pyganic interest they resulted in, a, and also interest rooted with a no fly and pyganic. They resulted in a significantly low damage on the plants, um, followed by a no fly and the grandiva. So here you can see uh, the effect of interest. Um, this is a plot treated with the interest uh, in comparison to the control plot. So in summary, interest and pyganic consistently performed well in suppressing the uh, uh, leaf beetle population and also the damage. The grandiva was effective against larvae. The interest can be applied in rotation with uh, either no fly or pyganic. So that's all I have. Um, I will pass on to Dr. Ron in Florida. All right, thank you, Rao. Uh, welcome, everybody. As Alice mentioned, my specialty is biological control. So I'm going to be presenting some some results that uh, I and a couple of my graduate students have, uh, have produced in, in our research here in South Florida. First, I want to establish what my definition of biological control is, because there are many definitions of biological control. So I define biological control as the direct action of parasites, predators, and pathogens, which we call natural enemies that maintain and regulate an organism's population density at an average level lower than would exist in their absence. Now this is a long and complicated word definition, so I want to visualize this definition in this graph. So this graph visually displays the word definition of biological control from the previous slide. When there's my arrow. When biological control agents are absent or ineffective, the mean density level of the target organism is high. This mean density level may be above the economically damaging levels. Introduce one or more biological control agents or release a large number of them to increase their density or modify the environment in such a way that favors them and makes them more effective as biological control agents, and you see what happens. The density of the target organism, or target pest, goes down and then fluctuates around a new mean density level significantly lower than the higher mean density level when the biological control agents were not there or not effective. This lower mean density level may be below economically damaging levels. And notice that the biological control agents did not eradicate the pest. Biological control does not eradicate. Uh, so in, when we humans get involved in the natural phenomenon of biological control, we call it applied biological control. And there are three tactics in applied biological control. The first is classical biological control, also called importation biological control. This is when we go overseas to the homeland of the pest and look for exotic biological control agents, bi exotic parasites or predators, and study them and bring them here, look at them more carefully, and then petition permission from USDA to release them into the environment. I'll have more to say about classical biological control of yellow margin leaf beetle in a moment. 
Then the second tactic is conservation biological control. This is when we manipulate the environment to disfavor the pest and favor the natural enemies that attack the pest. This could be managing vegetation inside and outside the crop. It could be managing horticultural or agronomic practices. Whatever manipulates, changes, modifies the environment to make the resident natural enemies more effective at what they do. Then there's augmentation biological control when we can multiply, reproduce thousands, millions of natural enemies, provide them commercially, and release these to greater levels in the field so that there's a more optimal ratio of natural enemies to pests in the field. For augmentation biological control, a good resource for information is the Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers. And this is a screenshot of their, of their website. And you can see their, their URL at the bottom there. there are lots of good information here, but probably one of the most pertinent is where the arrow indicates members and products. If you go to this website and click on members and products, it will give you a list of all of the members of ANBP, not only members who are producers and distributors of natural enemies, but researchers and people interested in, in augmentation biological control. But the producers and distributors listed uh, there um, provide their website, provide their catalog so you can get information on what natural enemies are available for what pests. Waiting for the next slide. There we go. Oops. Let's go back. So looking at these three tactics of applied biological control, classical biological control, unfortunately, there are no known specific parasites or predators of yellow margin leaf beetle. We don't know why none have been found. Maybe none have been looked for, and they do exist. We don't know. As far as conservation biological control, we really have insufficient information on the ecology of the resident natural enemies that are found in the cropping systems that might contribute to control, biological control of yellow margin, yellow margin leaf beetle. And we even have insufficient information about the ecology of the yellow margin leaf beetle. Here in South Florida, it disappears during the summer. We don't know exactly where it goes. We have some ideas, but maybe if we knew more about the ecology of the pest, we could manipulate the environment during the summer when it's at its weakest, and that would lessen the amount of, of pests that would occur in late fall when they show up here in South Florida. And then for augmentation biological control, the third applied biological control tactic, there are generalist predators available in the marketplace. And one of these is the spined soldier bug. This is a native North American species found throughout the eastern United States. And it is uh, common in many, many different cropping systems and has, an, has even been researched considerably for control of other beetles like the yellow margin leaf beetle, such as the Colorado potato beetle. So one of my graduate students a couple of years ago looked at the killing rates that spine soldier bugs can cause. And the nymphs can kill one to seven yellow margin leaf beetle larvae per day. That one to seven depends on the age of the nymph, the, the, the young nymphs killing fewer than the older nymphs. But that's a pretty good rate of kill per day, one to seven pests per day. And in a larva, in, in a, uh, in a nymph's lifetime, it is capable of killing up to 59 yellow margin leaf beetle larvae. The adults are just as voracious. They can kill five to six yellow margin leaf beetle larvae per day. And one adult in 10 days can kill up to 13 yellow margin leaf beetle larvae. So here you see an adult feeding, an uh, adult spined soldier bug feeding on a larval yellow margin leaf beetle. And you notice the spine pronotum here of the adult. That's where it gets its name, spined soldier bug. There are a lot of pest stink bugs out in the crops that look very much like the spined soldier bug. But the, 
this protuberance on the pronotum here will be very blunt, will be very dull. It will not be a sharp spine as it is in this insect. So this same graduate student did a field cage study and in three cage, in cages with turnips inside the cage, she released a low number of spine soldier bug nymphs, a medium number, and a high number, and you see those results here compared to the control where there were no spine soldier bugs present. The low rate really didn't do much, but you can see the medium rate and the high rate did significantly lower the number of live yellow Martian leaf beetle larvae in the cage overall, reducing the population of the yellow Martian leaf beetle by 75 to 85 percent. So we took off from this study and in the last couple of years we've done a couple of field studies where we set up plots very like what Rao did and um, we released either three or six nymphs per plant. Uh, our first year of study was on mustard, but then last year and this year we, we switched to bok choy. And then we monitored the plants every week and looked at the number of adults, yellow margin leaf beetle, eggs, larvae, and pupae of yellow margin leaf beetle. And those results for this year's study that we did earlier in this year in 2014, we did this research on two farms, one at White Rabbit Farm in Vero Beach, Florida, and we did two trials at the Kai Kai Farm near Indian Town in South Florida. So these are results from the three different farms. You see, we really got some mixed results. We Some weeks there were really no differences between the three treatments, blue being the control, red being the low treatment, low release rate, and the green being the high release rate. But in some weeks we did see a difference where it, the high release rate did significantly lower the population of yellow margin leaf beetle larvae as it did during this third week at White Rabbit, this third week at Kai Kai, and during the first two weeks at Kai Kai. This was later in the winter than the first trial here and the populations of yellow margin leaf beetle were much, much higher in this trial than they were in this trial. So at low populations, it looks like the, the results are mixed, but when the populations are relatively high, yellow, the releases of spine soldier bug, bug nymphs can make a difference and lower the yellow leaf margin leaf beetle uh, larval population. But what's really important is the amount of damage that the pest does. And so we looked at leaf damage, harvested leaves, looked at the amount of leaf that had been eaten by the beetles. And you see the results here from the three farms. And in all three farms, we see that the plots, they're shown in green, with the high release rate, were much suffered much less leaf damage than uh, the other two plots. And even sometimes there was a difference between the control and the low release plots. So as far as reducing the amount of leaf damage, it looks like at least the release rate of six nymphs per plant can significantly reduce the amount of, of leaf damage. And then just as Rao did in, in Alabama, we did a plant damage rating. And you see the same thing here where in uh, where we released uh, spine soldier bug nymphs, there was, there was much less plant damage. The plants fared much, much better when we released the spine soldier bug nymphs than when we did not in the control. I have another graduate student who looked at uh, green lacewing larvae. Maybe you're familiar with these. These are generalist predators that feed on insect eggs, uh, small insects, and the, uh, the adults are, are, are not predaceous. They feed only on nectar and pollen, but the larvae are very voracious predators and are sold by many producers and distributors throughout the United States and Canada. Her study showed that the larvae of, yellow, of the green lacewing can eat anywhere from three to 67 yellow margin leaf beetle eggs per day. 
again, the number depending on the age of the green lacewing larva. And during a larva's lifetime, it is capable of killing anywhere from 500 to 600 yellow margin leaf beetle uh, eggs. And as far as killing yellow margin leaf beetle first instars, the green lacewing larvae can kill anywhere from 2 to 42 per day. That's quite an astonishing kill rate. And per larva, the green lacewing can kill anywhere from 220 to 225 during its uh, larval growth period. So this is another very, very voracious predator. The problem is that, that it, it develops very fine to the pupil stage, but the adult has great problems emerging from the pupa so that we can't get continuing generations of the green lacewing and the larvae. So it may not be important. We may just be able to keep releasing green lacewings if they can get down to where the eggs are found and, and eat all those eggs. But as for continuing a population of green lacewing larvae, that may not be possible because there's something that's not allowing the pupa of the green lacewing to become an adult. And then the last natural enemy that we're investigating is an entomopathogenic fungus called Isaria fumosa rosea. This is another commercially available biological control agent. Uh, one formulation, one product is called PFR97. This is a strain that was developed, discovered and developed uh, by researchers at the Mid-Florida Research and Education Center in Apopka, Florida. And it attacks a great number of insects and will attack larvae and eggs of the yellow margin leaf beetle. In the laboratory, we didn't get a great amount of percentage infection of the eggs, um, but maybe we just need to do more research on that and see if that was a matter of our methodology or is it really the fungus does not do well against the eggs of the yellow margin leaf beetle. But it does readily infect the larvae of the yellow margin leaf beetle and we were getting pretty good infection rates in the laboratory. And it really affects the larvae by reducing their growth. You, look, you see here a normal uninfected yellow margin leaf beetle larvae, whereas these are larvae of the same age, yet their growth is stunted because they are infected with the entomopathogenic fungus. And you see these other images here of larvae infected by the fungus, reduced size, reduced feeding on the plant, and death of the insect. So this is something that uh, we've been investigating. We need to do more research on this point. So to summarize, we need to do some exploration in Argentina. That's where this pest is from and that's where we expect to find effective specific natural enemies, predators or parasites and uh, the only thing really holding us back from going down to Argentina is a lack of funding. We need to do more studies on the ecology of the resident natural enemies. There are other stink bugs out there, predaceous stink bugs, like the spine soldier bug that may be of benefit. And if we knew how to increase those, their numbers, um, then that might work out for biological control of yellow margin leaf beetle. And we need to do more research, research on the releases of spine soldier bugs and maybe green lacewing larvae because they do show potential, but more trials and economic analysis are necessary. And of course, we need to do more investigation of entomopathogenic uh, fungi, particularly Isaria fumosa rosea. Really what we've done is just in the laboratory, so we need to uh, do some, some research in the field. Anyway, that's all I have, so I, I welcome you to the webinar and I thank you for your attention. This is Ainava again from uh, Auburn University, Alabama Cooperative Extension, and I'm going to just wrap up this session. And now that uh, we have heard um, both the researchers and now we have all the ideas in our head, uh, I'll try to summarize all, all of it and make sense of it. Um, let's see if I have controls. Uh, well, just to summarize again, um, 
look for the adults of these beetles. When you are scouting for this insect, this insect uh, does not give you advanced warning. Even a few can be deadly. So look for the adults. They're always on the move. Um, and as you have heard before, they, just they have a strong preference for various host plants. And if you think about producers, small producers, you will have multiple crops. Uh, you did. And you'll see the different feeding patterns uh, and feeding uh, damage levels on those crops. Uh, don't let that happen, the, the photo on, the, on your right. That's too late to do anything. So look for early defoliations, uh, especially if you have turnips out there. Next. Field sanitation is very important. Um, that's always the starting point for, for crops, uh, especially for specialty crops. Uh, don't leave the crop out there after he, you don't need it. Uh, if you're done harvesting, if you're done, done with it, remove the plants. Um, because otherwise the insects will linger on and there will be extra generations and more buildup of the pests. Um, the larvae of this insect, yellow margin leaf beetle, are more susceptible um, than the adults. Adults have hardy shell, um, they have the strong elytra, um, and that protects them from freezing. But larvae are, are more susceptible to the environment, they're more susceptible to uh, natural enemies like you just heard. Uh, so we do need to protect those natural enemies in, in, at, at, at all costs. If you can't release them, protect them. Next. Uh, we all have about, heard about trap cropping, and this is just a, a quick wrap-up of trap crops. Uh, perimeter trap crops do work. However, you have to remember to plant the trap crop two weeks before the main crop so that the insect is attracted to that trap crop and stays away from your main crop. And then absolutely control the beetle on the trap crop, uh, which means that you cannot go on a vacation after planting a trap crop. Uh, trap crops takes time. Trap crop takes more management. So you have to have more, um, more planning when you do trap crop. Absolutely scout weekly or more often as needed because this insect can really uh, go fast across your field and damage your crop. And uh, treat when the numbers exceed one adult per plant. That's just from our experience. We don't have scientific data at this point, but that's our best guess. Um, you will you'll probably have never have one adult in your field, so you probably have more. So don't uh, let the populations explode. Uh, we'll talk about biopesticides on the next slide. Next. Here's some of the biopesticides that you have already seen on the slides. Uh, Spinosad is a great product for organic producers. Um, however, it is also the most expensive, uh, but it is a lifesaver in a lot of cases, and especially in case of yellow margin leaf beetle. Uh, it gets, gives very good control of adult and larvae um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in fields. Uh, Pyganic is also good, but it, it's very effective on the larvae, not so much on the adult. Um, the last two products are kind of a newer product. Uh, they're all very good for use in rotation, so don't overuse Spinosad or Pyganic. Try to rotate when you are uh, out there uh, making a decision. Try to rotate, and, uh, and, and if you're doing weekly sprays, make sure you're scouting to see if the insect is there or not. Stop, spr stop uh, spraying as soon as you see the insect is under control. If you overspray, you will affect the natural enemies. So protect those natural enemies by not overspraying. Next. Uh, we are doing very intensive training for producers here in Alabama. There are just some pictures to show you uh, part of the IPM ca campaign. Uh, one of the things we do uh, a lot is, um, is help farmers who are undergoing some kind of an outbreak. Um, this slide kind of, this and the other slides give you an idea of some of the publications we have. Uh, go on, Alex, to the next one. Uh, here's one of the uh, IPM newsletters that we have in Alabama. We have about uh, 1,400 producers on here. Uh, it's, it's a fast way of spreading the information. Um, and we have a web-based, it's suitable for web-based as well as um, desktop viewing. Go on, Alex. We also have uh, done some new publications, including a high tunnel handbook for new beginning farmer. 
which just came on, uh, which I just received my first copy yesterday. And we, we are going to be giving these to all producers in Alabama. And then the IPM slide chart, which is on the right, uh, it, it uh, provides what you just heard, provides that information onto a slide chart instead of a, uh, just your regular publication. This is a slide chart. Um, and it has about 21 insects listed, including a lot of pests from crucifers. Uh, and these are being given out at our extension event. Next. Uh, this is the Alabama Vegetable IPM Project website. You can bookmark it, uh, email, find my email information, contact information. Next. Um, because everybody is on Facebook, so we are on Facebook as well. And the Facebook is actually connected to the IPM newsletter. So it really helps to get the word out. And we have access to about 1,000 producers uh, besides this page where we can send out information in a flash. Uh, it's also great for, for videos, looking at videos and online photo ID. Um, and Facebook has an app, so it's really a free service for us. Uh, and we are able to provide that to producers. Next. That's it for, uh, from this team. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the uh, Organic Agriculture Research Education Initiative for funding this project. Uh, we have Unmuted. Uh, part, uh, help we have got from uh, producers in Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. We are very thankful to the field staff uh, and the research staff at the University Farms. And um, uh, I'm thankful to the, um, uh, my IPM program assistant, uh, Ann Chemrick, who gives, sends out that information to the needy producers. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop and open this session for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're about to begin the question and answer session. So if you missed the very beginning of the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. If you don't see the question box, just click the small plus sign next to the word question and that will open it up. I also wanted to mention that we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out the follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. This webinar was recorded, so if you want to find it again or share it with others, um, we'll be posting it within the coming week on our website at the link on your screen. Um, if after the webinar um, you have additional questions about this topic, Ayanava kindly um, offered you to look up his contact information, and you're also welcome to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service for general questions about organic farming. So we do have several um, questions already coming in. Um, don't be shy. Um, we don't have a huge audience, so we'll probably have time for all of them. Um, Let's see, is the range of the yellow margin leaf beetle expanding or is it stable? Well, this is Ron Cave. I think I, think I can answer that because um, we did some cold tolerance studies to look at where this insect might spread throughout the United States. You know, it's already documented to occur not only in, in Florida and Alabama, but also it's known to occur in Texas, Mississippi, North Carolina, Louisiana and in Georgia, but uh, we predicted that it might spread to Kansas, southern Illinois, northern Kentucky, and northern Virginia. And in fact, there was just a very brief publication out um, either earlier this year or last year reporting it from southern Illinois. So it looks like it is advancing uh, slowly north, or it has that potential to to reach. Uh, uh, the more northern southern states of Kansas, Illinois, Kentucky, and Virginia. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for growers um, that have a highly intercropped system in which there are not big plots of just one plant species? So um, turnips as a trap crop planted in the per perimeter of an area might not be economically viable. Do you have any comments about that? Okay, I, I can answer this one. Um, if it is not a perimeter trap crop, and if, if the growers has multiple uh, crucifer crops, they can use uh, turnip as a intercrop, and, um, and also they can plant it in the early season. So like I said, the main problem is from the uh, migrating beetles. Once we catch, and um, once we control those migrating beetles, um, from the over uh, from the east waiting sites, um, 
then we can pretty much keep the con keep the insect under control. So that is the key point. As as long as we can manage uh, our wind, uh, our I mean yeast evading, um, beetle population, I mean migrating beetle population, then we can pretty much control. So the answer is intercropping of turnips. We work on a couple of farms that are highly intercropped, uh, like the questioner mentioned, and the person with that question, anybody else might take a close look at is when you plant your your crop that is susceptible to yellow margin leaf beetle next to something, take a look. Is it heavily infested? Are your plants not heavily infested? A lot of times the neighboring plants might have an effect on the infestation level in the Napa cabbage or, or other coal crop that is attacked by the yellow margin leaf beetle. So some we have seen, but we haven't looked at it intensely, is that sometimes when the the host plants for the yellow margin leaf beetle are planted next to strawberries or next to onions, they're not as heavily infested as if they were infested next to some other plant. So take a look at what are the nearby plants that you have your, your infested plants with and, and maybe you'll see some differences there. But that's a line of research that really needs to be looked at. Um, in line with that, um, we have a question on um, which vegetable crops um, the beetle focuses on, just the primary ones that you mentioned, or what about other vegetable crops? Was it just um, the crucifers? Or? Um, it, it's made, it, like I said, it is uh, mainly crucifers. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the plants, most of the plants in the crucifers, like... Uh, uh, Arugula, tetsoy, bok choy, mustard, you name it, all the brassicaceae uh, family crops. So not other other plants, yeah, as I know. Um, this is Ainava from Auburn. Um, one thing I'll add is uh, last week uh, I was scouting in a high tunnel uh, here in Alabama. This guy has three high tunnels with turnips and kale and, and cabbage. It was uh, and he has most of his turnips on the outside uh, towards the side walls, and his turnips looked awful because the yellow margin leaf beetles had started to show up. Uh, and he, he had cleverly harvested his earlier crop before the insects got too bad, but now the insects are feeding on, his, on the new leaves that are coming out, and they and the kale and the cabbage around uh, was not touched, um, and uh, they were planted very close. So that was another very important learning uh, moment right there for the producer. And I was there to tell him more about it. But this insect does sh show this remarkable um, attractiveness to certain crops, uh, almost loving to death kind of deal. Um, there's even some preference with, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Ron. I guess just say there's even some preference. Yeah, they do only attack crucifer crops um, because it's the smell and the taste of crucifer crops that cues their feeding. But even there is a high preference for some crucifer crops over others. Their, their real preference is turnips and napa cabbage or bok choy. Uh, they have a less preference for things like broccoli and cabbage. In fact, we had some turnips next to um, broccoli right next to each other and boy, the yellow margin leaf beetles were just hammering the turnips. But until those turnips were gnawed to the ground, they didn't touch the, bro uh, the broccoli and the cabbage. Hmm. So they seem to like the ones with thinner leaves. Um, you talked about the effectiveness of turnips as a trap crop in Alabama. Um, have you seen the same results in Florida for that? Um, yes, uh, we we did see the same results, but some some it, it it varied a little bit based on what type of cash crop that we use. Uh, like I said, if the um, if the preference, you know, if we choose comparatively, you know, same kind of preferred. Uh, crop as a cash crop, the results were not so impressive, but they they show the similar trends. 
um, they did uh, one season. They 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 showed the significant uh, uh, protection from the beetles, but other season it not so well. So it all depends on what kind of cash crop and truck crop combination that we use. Okay. Um, how long will the biopesticide um, protect the plants for? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we never looked at how long they will. Um, and some of, I mean, most of my trials, but the biopesticide was not very good, um, you know, it, it never showed a very good efficacy. It did, it, it did perform better than control, but it's not, it's not as, as good as we expected. Um, but we never looked at how long you know, it will protect. Uh, let me add, this is Ainava uh, from Alabama Extension. Um, just based on studies, not on turnips, but on cabbages and some other coal crops, uh, some other industry work we do, we have seen that um, the NOSED has a, has a good penetration and good residual effect compared to some of the other biological control agents, um, especially if you are using any microbial pesticides, you do have to consider uh, or take steps to increase persistence of those products because those are live insecticides. Um, so you cannot uh, use, um, for example, Isaria or no-fly the same way as spinosad. Um, you have to think or uh, be more creative in using uh, living insecticides compared to uh, uh, more chemical type product uh, like spinosad. Um, so you and again target the insects when they are small. I think the big mistakes our producers sometimes make is they detect the insect too light, and then there's a struggle. It's a battle to get them under control. So control the insects when they're small. You need less insecticide, and cost of uh, management goes down significantly that way. Okay. Um, here's a question about um, the work you've done with soldier bugs, um, nymphs. Do they move between plants, or do they just stay on one plant? Um, can you talk about that? Oh yes, they, they do move. In fact, this we noticed that sometimes one or two nymphs would move from the plot where we where we released them to our control plot where we did not release them. But that only occurred once or twice. But yes, they will move certainly between plants. Even we were releasing six nymphs per plant and then we'd come back a, a week or two later and we'd find 10 on one plant and zero on the plant next to it. So, oh yes, they, they, they do move. They don't fly, so they'll have to crawl down the plant and then uh, crawl on the, on the soil or the white plastic mulch that uh, some growers use and then go to the next plant. But certainly, yes, there is plant, uh, movement between plants. Okay, and um, do you, you re recommend rotating and trust with Grandivo and or Pyganic with Grandivo? Would you recommend doing that? Um, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, here's a question about whether or not you've ID'd the native plant in Argentina that supports this beetle. Um, it, it's I think it's been found on wild brassica, brass, what, it's the same species here, brassica campestris or something like that. But it's really on any um, brass crucifers down there. It attacks crucifer crops down there. It gets in their 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 cultivated uh, coal crops also. But um, so down there, yeah, it's it's getting on the same crucifer crops that are here and the same wild crucifers that, that we have here in the United States. Okay, um, here's a comment from a grower. Um, it says turnips are in one field. Um, he doesn't have time to plant a, a cover crop. I'm not sure if you mean strap crop. Um, haven't noticed damage. Um, as a guard had brought harlequin beetles into control and probably will do a number on the yellow margin leaf beetle too. Have you um, had any experience with that product? 
with what's the product again? As a guard. As a guard. I don't know okay. that. Okay. Mentioned harlequin be harlequin bugs. Mm -hmm. Harlequin bug is another stink bug related to the spine soldier bug, and it does. But it's it's a it's a plant feeding stink bug, not a predaceous stink bug. It feeds on the plant. So if you and it's a very colorful stink bug. So, and it's very very differently colored than the spine soldier bug. So. Harlequin beagle, harlequin bugs are a pest. They're not a, they're bio, they are not a biological control agent. Okay. Uh, Alice, this, yep. Alice, this is Ainava. Um, going to back to that as a guard question, mm -hmm. I just looked up the label and it is a neem based product. Okay. And so that the active ingredient is is a direct and uh, and. Um, that's not something that was tested here. Neem typically is a good product for early or small caterpillars, white flies, aphids, any of those soft-bodied small insects. Um, neem is particularly good on, on white flies and, and to some level spider mites. But again, um, neem if it is used, um, not for yellow margin leaf beetle because we don't have the data on it, um, it, it should be um, used, you know, when the insects are small and, and soft, not, not the big, uh, bold insects. Um, so Isagard is a neem-based product. Okay. Um, if anyone has any more questions, um, we have a couple more minutes to answer them, so um, feel free to type them in right now. Um, we'll just give another um, couple seconds or two to just see if anybody types in any additional questions. Um, so let's just give them a second. Okay. While we're waiting, um, while we're waiting for yeah. more questions, Alice. Sure. I, I was I was very interested to see that in Alabama they were using white plastic mulch to cover the beds where the the, the plots were grown, and our Indian town, our Kai Kai farmer, does that too. The white mulch. Pokes a hole in the in the white plastic mulch and then plants the uh, the bok choy or the turnip or whatever, and we noticed that the yellow margin leaf beetle really loves to lay their eggs around the lip of that hole in the white plastic. So something we're going to be looking at is is are there greater yellow margin leaf beetle populations when that white plastic is used because that might be favoring overposition and decreasing predation on the eggs, we don't know, but uh, we know that um, where there's that, that white plastic is used, there are many, many more yellow margin leaf beetles. And then the, the same grower in Indian Town did a small trial uh, without the white plastic, and by golly, there were far, far fewer yellow margin leaf beetles. So that's something that we need to look at is, is this white plastic mulch increasing, favoring the populations of the pest. Okay, um, we do have a couple more questions coming in. Um, yeah, someone suggested um, comparing that with black plastic mulch and seeing if there is a uh, repellent effect. Um, okay, um, here's a good question. Where is the chart available outside the states that the research is done in? Ayanava, are those resources that you posted um, available online? Let me just go back to those slides and um, see um, if there's a link there. And if not, um, are they available online? And could we maybe post them on that webinar re registration page where the recording is going to be? Um, can you talk about where they might be available or how people, what people could type into Google to find them? Well, um, the um, the two big publications that I mentioned in the slides uh, are both physical publications. Uh, we will be posting uh, that high tunnel book that you have on the screen now is going to come out as an iBook instead of a PDF because the PDF is like 36 megabyte, yeah, okay. and so we have we are trying to make it into an iBook, and it's right now under production um, early next year. If you contact me by email, uh, my email is real easy to remember, bugdoctor at auburn.edu. Um, email me, and I can send you the link once it comes out as, a, as electronic. The other publication is a handheld 
field guide. Um, it is not something that's online, although I can share the, the data matrix. Um, th there is one place you can look up something similar, and that is the Southeast Vegetable Handbook, uh, Google Southeast Vegetable Handbook, and you will see a, a pretty big um, chart in there uh, that you can download and look at. Uh, but unfortunately, that alternative IPM slide chart is a physical uh, publication to be used in the field. Um, and I can certainly mail it to people who send in their information or contact me. Uh, I'll be glad to mail it. Okay, that's great. I just put your email into the chat box there so people can see it. Um, okay, that's great. Um, it's a question about whether beetles are attracted to sticky traps or any other pheromones. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we, I didn't present that data. We identified a couple of compounds that is um, plant-based, uh, crucifer plant-based uh, compounds like isothiocyanates or glucosinolates. Uh, we are still under the, um, you know, process of making it commercialization of the product. Um, but they are, uh, right now, they are not in market. Um, yes, we do have a lure, uh, uh, you know, for this beetle, but not in the, in the commercialization. Okay. Um, we had a question about um, how um, a grower's turnip greens have small holes, but nothing like yellow margin leaf beetle holes. Um, he wanted to know what some culprits are. I know we recently had a webinar on flea beetles, um, which are certainly one culprit. Um, do you have any other comments about that? I, I agree with that. I believe that that must be a flea beetle. What crop was that, Alice? Um, on turnip greens. That could be a flea beetle, Alice. Okay, I, uh, we have in our archive a link to a recent webinar um, by Joyce Parker of the EPA on flea beetles. So if you're interested in learning more about them, you can um, take a look in our archive because the recording is posted. Um, we have one last question before we end. Um, was, ro was row covering fabric ever used in this study? Yeah, I can answer that. Yes, uh, the farmers, they usually use the row cover, but like we know, the challenge with the row, uh, row cover is once the insects sneak in, um, you know, they are difficult to uh, control because they are protected under the cover. Um, so they multiply quickly and they damage the crop. Um, the row covers uh, do work as long as we seal them pretty well with uh, you know, no gaps. Um, but yes, the, some growers do use a row cover in our state. Okay, well, we're running out of time now, so I'd like to thank everyone for your questions and uh, say once again that you can find um, this and many of our other upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics, um, many of which this year are on insect management at the link on your screen. And we would also very much appreciate it if you could fill out the survey that you'll be receiving in an email later today. Thank you very much, Drs. Belusu, um, Majumdar, and Kate for presenting the results of your research and thank you for ev to everyone for joining us.